We are thankful that you have bought us with a price, that you, um, you made us, you created us, and now through Christ you have made us anew, you've made us recreated. So Lord, I just pray that as we open your word, your Holy Spirit would speak to us, your Holy Spirit would make known to us what your word says and help us to apply it to our lives as, as we don't want to just be hearers, but we want to be hearers that do that in faith we follow you, we trust you, that you have made us with your workmanship. And so, Lord, we are your people. And we sit underneath your word. So speak your word to us today as we look at you, as we see you afresh. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we are in... Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> and starting in verse 15 is where we're going to be reading from 15 to 21. If you want to stand as I read the word, um, why don't we stand together? Actually, I'm going to back up a few verses to 13. So, uh, But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk. Not not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. May God bless the reading of his word as you sit back down. You know, we are in a busy world. Hesitate for a minute at a light that turns green and the whole world begins honking. (laughs) Our world has become much like that of uh, Wonderland, where the queen informs the inhabitants that the inhabitants of the wonderland there to Alice are running very fast to get everywhere or to get anywhere. To Alice, she says, it takes all the running you can do just to keep in the same place. If you want to get anywhere else, you need to run at least twice as fast as that. Sometimes we feel this way. We feel that things are happening at a rapid pace. And what Paul is here emphasizing Not only is it happening rapidly, Paul emphasizes that the days themselves are evil. So we must ransom them, we must buy them back to our Redeemer King Jesus. For we have been bought back at a price. We need our King in the midst of this rebellious, evil world that seems to be so out of control. See, the world walks unwisely, foolishly, following their own hearts, filling themselves with their own desires and evil rebellion against our good and gracious God. So today, we're going to unpack this passage and talk about the fullness of God's presence transforms the way we walk. And there's going to be three characteristics or ways that Christians are to walk in this world. Ways that we are to walk with gospel power. Gospel power is what we need. The first point, we walk looking to God's wisdom. We look to God's wisdom. So here he begins the passage saying, we have to be careful how you walk. He says we are to carefully walk. Are we carefully walking? What does that mean? It actually, uh, therefore, or then, as I think the ESV translates it, uh, then, look, there for, look carefully then how you will walk, is kind of a conjunction there. 
uh, showing and signifying that God is saying, because Christ has shined on you, like in verse 14, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you. Because Christ has risen and has awoken from the grave, now he is shining on his people that he's bringing resurrected power to his people in a way that, we, that the, they had never seen before. And it reminds us that the gospel actually changes fundamentally everything in your life. The gospel rescues you from the evil that once inhabited your heart. That doesn't mean, again, we still have remaining sin until heaven, but there is a, an effect that God has already come to um, live and reign in your life. So we are predestined, we're adopted as God's children, no longer strangers or aliens, right? In uh, chapter 2, we are actually citizens of a new kingdom. We're members of God's household of faith. Our identity is found in and through Christ himself. We are one in spirit to the Father, and that is good news. We're not alone. Because God's glory is revealed in the church. Prison, persecution, can't stop it. Nothing can stop or conceal completely the glory of God in his people as you walk with him. And that's why he calls us children of light. Children that are walking in the light. Gospel, the gospel produces humility. It produces gentleness and patience and love. All these things are happening As we trust Christ, as we walk with Christ in the gospel, he is producing these fruit in our lives, fruit of light. We are members of of the body of Christ, he says in chapter 4. We're members, no longer members who walk like the world. We're, We're walking like Christ. We're called to walk like Christ. And this is a supernatural endeavor. This is not something that you can manufacture. You need God's help and presence to do it. And it, he builds us up in love. It's chapter 4, 17. So, so then he goes on to say, imitate God as children do their fathers in 5.1. So 5.1, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how God calls us to be imitators of God himself. That is a big task if you think about it. How do you imitate God? And the only way we can imitate God is because of what Christ has done. In fact, we cannot even see God apart from Christ, right? So Christ shows up in a way that he reveals God to us, and he brings resurrected power, forgiveness. He brings a reigning kingdom that even though we can't see, we know the beachhead of the church exists as a result of what Christ did 2,000 years ago. And that's good news. It's It's not just okay news or mediocre news, it's like wake up, smell the coffee, good news. The news of Jesus coming and reigning and ruling should wake us up from the slumber that the world tries to induce by distracting us. Instead, we should keep our eyes on the cross and on the empty tomb and ultimately on our king because he reminds us in in 5-7 of Ephesians, he says, then we will not partner as members of the world because we're members with Christ, because he says what's happening is wrath is coming to those who love sin. So there's no in-between. Either you love sin or you love Christ. You've been ransomed from sin to Christ. If you love sin, you don't love Christ. That's what he's essentially saying. And so, so we constantly, when we see sin in our lives, we repent and believe the gospel. And here, In verse 15, we're picking that up. He says, since Christ has shown you with the gospel, now arise, wake up, be alive in him. We are called to live differently, to look carefully, is what the the word there says translated. And you have been raised with him. You've been awakened. You've been made new in him. So standing in the gospel means living in truth, in righteousness that Christ alone provides. And we'll get to that point when we get to chapter 6. But we're called to stand firm on the rock of Christ. Stand firm in Christ, in who he is. So here it says to look out, to watch, watch, to guard, to pay careful attention. 
is the idea of accurately accounting, right? The, the, the word there is to accurately walk. Be careful how you walk because there's many ways in which you can fall down. In fact, if you think about it, we could not walk without light. Not well, anyway. We need the light of the sun to walk well. At the nighttime, we can't walk well. And so C.S. Lewis aptly says that because of Christ, we now see to walk in the light. That's what Paul is saying. Because of Christ, like the sun, he shines down on us, bringing light to bear on the world through him, not in and of ourselves, but through Christ in us. And we begin to see how to walk, how to accurately live in light of what Christ has done. Paul is saying that now you have the light of Christ shining upon you and in you and through you, so watch your steps carefully because you're living in light of the eternal king. And Luke uses this same word uh, to carefully, accurately, to watch or guard. He uses this word and notes uh, that he is trying to be accurate and clear. Luke was known for his accuracy, his clarity, his hard-to-read Greek, you know, all these things. He was known for all these things. But seeing Christ clearly changes how we live. We look to Christ. We want to accurately see Christ. We want to accurately show Christ to those around us in a way that reveals how good he is. So how you live, how you walk around, uh, how you walk from day to day is tied to how we're following Christ. And Paul has used walk now seven times in this, in this, up to this point to show us, and I think this is the last time he uses it in, in, the, pat, in the book, <clears throat> but he shows us you once walked as you were dead in sins, that he has made you uh, his workmanship or his poem to walk. It's poema. It's the idea of making you uh, like an artistic poetry as you walk in good works that God has rescued you in order to do. Again, we can't put the cart before the horse. Works do not save us. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Works are an outworking of what Christ is already doing in our hearts and lives. And so what he is working, we now live in joyful celebration that he himself has done it. So nothing we do adds to what Christ has done. But it does show how good he is, how amazing he is, that he's able to take those who were once in darkness and make them alive. No one else does that. No one else can do that. We have a God that can do the impossible. The unsearchable riches of Christ bring multicolored wisdom multifaceted wisdom to the church and his building in, in verses, uh, verse 10 of chapter 3. So the first third of the book <clears throat> of Proverbs, talking about wisdom, we're called, called to walk in wisdom, not the world's unwisdom, not to be unwise. The first third of the Proverbs really talks about wisdom personified as a wise, attractive woman calling people to come to hit her to come and feast with her and, and calls, her to, calls people to fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the New Testament, Paul deplores the so-called wisdom of the Greeks, and instead, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those God has called, both Greeks and Jews, it's the power, Christ is the power of God in the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. That's his argument. He said, he said even if you, God was being foolish, it's head and shoulders a million times wiser than man's wisdom. So, there are two parts of this wisdom. It's content centered on knowing the person of Christ himself. So we, we need to Focus on who Christ is, because he is the wisdom of God, it says. But also, the application of that content practically. How are you walking with Christ? How do you live with wisdom in the midst of a world 
that is evil, that says has evil days even? See, these, these are the questions that Paul is trying to address in this section of Ephesians, and it gets to the very heart of wisdom. See, do you seek God's wisdom, or do you try to Google an answer on your own? Right? That's, that's the question. Today, we're too quick to go and try to fix it on our own or try to look for worldly wisdom, but when, in fact, we need something that only God can provide. So here, he refers to redeeming the time, making the best use of time, literally buying back time. Christ comes to a time and space, and, and it, what's unique about Christianity is that we don't, it's not a nature God, a nature religion. It's not something based in a cycle. It's based in history. And so the warp and woof of history is seen in what Christ has done. He's come into our space to rescue us from real evil. It's not just a personification, but he's a real redeemer. And he buys us back. He, he ransoms us. He gives us new life in himself. And so the redeeming of time is meant for us to look for every opportunity and to buy back from, from the evil days into a wise and gracious king of what we're called to do. It, it's often used of slaves purchasing their own freedom within the, within the Roman culture. Uh, Colossians 4, 5 says, we are to walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of our time. And so Christ has redeemed us even though we were under a curse, he's now bought us, he's rescued us, he's redeemed us, we're no longer under the law. As slaves, we're now adopted as sons, according to Galatians 3 and Galatians 4. L listen to the words here. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that Christ Jesus, the blessing of, the Abrahamic <clears throat> of Abraham, might Come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So God redeems us to bring us the promised spirit. Then in 4, he says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So here, it's talking about Christ being the redeemer. And the word actually means, it's the same word that's used here to redeem time, the word means to redeem, to buy back. Uh, it's used here to appeal to the ransom, the ransom of time from evil bondage. But it probably means, and, and is referring to buying up or using the time wisely. Uh, some would translate it, making the most use of the time. And so Kairos refers to opportunities that are passing and looking for ways to use those opportunities in your life to make much of Christ. Redeeming the time means we have a better king and we are sons of that king. So, to, the, so there's a couple words that Greek uses <clears throat> for kairos, uh, for, for time. Kairos is one of them. Kronos is another one. So you've probably heard of, like, chron, you know, chronos would mean basically time in a linear pattern. Kairos means season or waves, or decisive moments. And so divine appointments of God's sovereign working in time in your life is what he's saying. So God doesn't just say, redeem the time some way. He's, he's going to give us reasons and how to do that within this passage. But think of it this way. Wisdom is not just doing the same thing or doing what someone tells you to. Wisdom is knowing exactly the nuances of how to do something within a very um, time and space, a very specific time and space. And so many times we think, oh, if I only knew exactly the rules here of what to do, but really what, what God is saying is that you don't need the rules, you need a person. You need Christ. And that person is able to show up here in western New York, here in 2024, in ways that just good advice is not going to. The good news is that the king of the universe is right here with us. He's not, he hasn't left us. In fact, the passage we're going get, to get to uh, 
further down, as we read earlier. But, but basically, besides this, <clears throat> listen to what Paul says in Romans 13, 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from a sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So Paul told them to wake up. And now, he says the watch, uh, th- this is a season of watchfulness, to make the most for, of Christ, for soon we will see him again. We must use our gifts and the graces to further God's kingdom where we're at. So both, uh, this is from James Boyce, who used to be a pastor in Philadelphia. He says, <clears throat> both kairos and chronos refer to time and are frequently translated as time in the Bible. But chronos refers to that flow of time, the following of one event after another. And it, it is often the idea involved with chronology, whereas kairos refers to the moment that is especially significant and favorable, and knowing how to use that moment in that time and space takes wisdom. So, why does it take wisdom? Because the days are evil, it says. These are the last days, and soon Christ will return. He shows us, uh, he shows us that we live in an evil age. In fact, uh, Romans 8.18 says, there is a coming glory that Christ will outshine all of our sufferings. Mm-hmm. So all of the sufferings of your whole life aren't even worth a couple minutes in glory. So don't lose heart. Look to Christ. Christ also gave himself up for, to ransom us to, for, to his will from an evil age, Galatians 1.4. <clears throat> the evil days come against the church in Christ and call us to stand in him. And we'll, we'll study that more in depth when we get to Ephesians 6, which talks about spiritual warfare. But all this passage hinges on the fact that Christ has redeemed us. Christ has done every aspect to bring us from darkness to light. He's taken us and he's predestined us to be his children. Think of it, <clears throat> think of it this way. Um, this is, again, James Boyce, Dr. Boyce. He says, it has always been uh, realized in the main tradition of Christianity that if the word was made flesh, matter can never then be get regarded as totally evil in itself. In, in similar way, if one moment of time could hold so much as this, then you cannot brush time away and say that any moment of it is mere vanity. Every instant of time becomes more momentous than ever. Every instant is eschatological. Or, as one person put it, like the point in a fairy tale where the clock is just about to strike 12. On this view, <clears throat> on this view there can be no case for an absentee God leaving mankind to mercy of chance of the universe in a blind, stark, and bleak way. It's a real drama, not a madman's nightmare or a tissue of flimsy dreams. It's being enacted on the stage of human history. There's a real conflict between good and evil taking place in the events that we see. And something is being achieved irrespective of our apparent successes or failures. So we must make the most of the time that we have in order to enter into this conflict and make make contribution for good. God has put us here as such a time in such a place where as we live, we're called to live in the goodness of the gospel to make inroads of a kingdom yet to come. That is a big, big task. (coughs) Apart from God's help, we would be absolutely paralyzed in, in face of that task. But listen, Hebrews 12 spurs us on, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which clings closely to us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So who has the authority? Christ has the authority. Every moment should be brought to and bought to and um, presented under Christ's authority. So 
Point two is we walk learning God's will. We walk learning God's will. So how are we, you know, understanding or learning God's will? It says, stop ignoring what God says. Therefore, don't be foolish. Fools like to joke in evil, if you think about it. Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, Proverbs 10, 23. But wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. Fools despise wisdom, Proverbs 23, 9. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. So we, we see that foolishness is something we do not want to perceive, we don't want to follow, we don't want to um, instill within us, we want to look to see what the will of God is. In other words, God's will is inherently wise. We want to understand what God is doing in our time and place. So one of the ways we do that is we delight and meditate on God's word. Psalm 1-2 says we will be like a tree rooted in Christ himself if we meditate on God's word. Wisdom is defined as knowing the will of God. Psalm 119.9, let, let God's word guard and shape your life, not the world. Uh, the gospel redemption of his people is God's will for his people. He lavished wisdom and insight, making known his will. We, we, we talked about that in Ephesians 1, 7 through 9. So God expects us to seek him first in everything. How is your life centered on God and his word? Are we looking to God or are we looking to ourselves to try to do what only God can do? See, cognitive, we, we need to be put our minds to use for God's glory. We, God expects us to bring together our knowledge of his word with prayer, advice, discernment, seeking his will, talking to other believers. You know, the, the idea here um, <clears throat> of understanding is the idea of to bring together from different areas, to bring together and gather together. So that's what, in many regards, what we do when we look for the will of God. Someone can't necessarily tell us what the will of God is. God has to reveal it and uncover it for you. So we can know it's the will of God not to sin, but it's not necessarily always easy to, should I go to, should I go to school here? Should I take this job or that job? These are areas of wisdom that we need help from other believers, from the Word of God, being in the Word in prayer, and looking to God together. So are you dwelling on Christ as your hope? Because you were far worse in your sin and darkness and dead in trespasses. And so when we trust Christ, Christ who is rich in mercy, he rescues us from ourselves. He clothes us with his righteousness. <clears throat> and we now are able to live lives seeking to please God by the fullness of God's presence in our lives. So our understanding and view of God's will should grow in line with our view of the gospel. God's will changes us, if you think about it. For Christ himself was faithful, and he makes for us forgiveness and righteousness in himself, uh, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. God's will is sovereign. He has predestined us and adopted us. Uh, even before the world began, he had a will for your life. Look at uh, Ephesians 1.5 when you get a chance and, and think about that. God, God didn't leave anything to chance in your life. God's will is unveiled in Christ and, and should be set our <clears throat> lives in awe of our good and gracious king. So God unveils it for us. He opens it. If you, we ask, he shows us it. And sometimes not as quickly as we want, but he does show his will to you. 1.9, uh, Ephesians 1.9. <clears throat> is where we see that. So the will of the Lord is God's purpose, his rule in creation and history, and his rule in your life. See, this shows and appeals to Christ as our Lord and King. He has redeemed us from darkness. He has predestined us before creation. And now because of what Christ has done, he has come into our world, into, into this time and place, to bring his new kingdom to bear on a fallen, shaking, sinful world. And his kingdom will never fail. See, we have learned Christ, it says in 420. We are now light in Christ, in the Lord, <clears throat> in 5.8 we talked about. And we are lovingly adopted as 
as beloved, uh, as, as beloved in Christ's love. In other words, we're, we're secure in his love. And we must seek to determine what pleases the Lord in 510. So we are humble, and we're humbly called to redeem our time since we have been redeemed. We are called to be wise in seeking what God would have us do in each season that we're, we live in. And he is already at work, and he's already prepared works within each season for you to do in his power. See, pragmatism shortcuts what often, rather than seeking God, many people say, well, I can't do that, so I'm just going to do what I can. But in reality, what we need is wisdom that is only from God. Wisdom that brings us out of a pragmatistic worldview and helps us to see that we have a God that can do the impossible and often does the impossible. So Paul, Paul here, this is another quote from Dr. Boyce, Paul is talking about wisdom and about making the most of that specific historical time that God gives us to be in. It, it is as if he's, he's asking, what are we to do with our moments? How are we best to spend this day, this hour, this minute? What does God want us to be doing? See, against this backdrop, Paul seems to be encouraging us to, in, to perceive what God is doing and now in, in, in to act in accordance with what we see God doing. In other words, we're called to jump on God's bandwagon rather than look for a program of, salvation, of self-salvation. We look to God who already is working, and he will accomplish what he alone can do. So this is what brings us to our third point. We walk completely in God's presence. We walk completely in God's presence, or Fulfilled in God's presence would be another way to put it. Um, we, we don't seek to be drunk. Uh, that's what the world many times tries to uh, anesthetize their, their, their uh, inability to do things or their wisdom is, let's just dull the pain. Being drunk brings disgrace and foolishness. Uh, Proverbs 20 talks about wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by them are not wise. So drunkenness was a a big problem within the ancient world. In in some Greco-Roman religions, drunkenness was actually part of their religion. So Dionysus or or Bacchus, depending on who you read, uh, it was a prominent um, god, little g, (laughs) um, worshipped within Ephesus. And the vine was seen as, as his cultic symbol, and they would... Drink to excess. But wisdom says not to get drunk, not to spend time with those who could pull you into that world of drunkenness. So while drinking is not a sin, let's be clear, I know this is a Baptist church, but to drink is not a sin, to get drunk is a sin. So we have to be be clear where scripture is clear. Drinking uh, can lead to many other sins is what scripture says. Proverbs says, don't linger long under, over wine. In the end, it strikes like a serpent. We need the wisdom from God and his help to discern how and why we live for certain things. You see, the evil days flow into wasteful days and wasteful time. And so drunkenness leads to debauchery. And that, the idea of debauchery here is asodia, and, and, and the, um, the root of that is soteriology, or save, uh, so how you are saved. And basically, the word means incurable and not saved. And that's why it's, it's sobering to think that if you live under the influence of alcohol or some other substance, your behavior that flows out of it is going to be lacking concern or thought for any consequences of an action. And that's why Paul warns not to get drunk. Christ has redeemed us. He's now called us to redeem the time. And we can't redeem the time if we are so intoxicated that we don't know what time it is. It would be, uh, it would be the opposite If we were drunk, it would be wasting time, not living for God's glory, but leading to our own shame and sin. So here Paul contrasts the lack of control 
with the Spirit filling with redemptive control, filling us to fill others with the glory of Christ unveiled. It, it degrades the drinker when we drink. It's a depressant, as, as Martin Lloyd-Jones said. He said, but if God's Spirit were put in a pharmaceutical manual, he would say that it, it is, it, it's a stimulant, that he stimulates us to growth and godliness. And I think that's, that's interesting, for, coming from a medical doctor, that he said, these other things will depress you. But Christ brings life and stimulation within your life so that others are built up, that we are built up in the faith. So we seek to be filled with God's presence. It says, be filled with the Spirit. It's, it's, a, it's actually a, a, passive, a, a passive command saying, allow yourself to be filled. Allow the Spirit to be active in your life. The Spirit comes to fill us at conversion. So we call that um, baptism in the Spirit. It's not a separate uh, instance. It's being filled at conversion with the Spirit of God, Ephesians 1 and 2. We are baptized into the Spirit by the works of the Spirit and first, uh, by the work of the, that the Spirit alone could do. This isn't something, some extra thing. The Spirit brings into our lives his very presence, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We are sealed in the Spirit, made secure in Christ by the Spirit, connected to Christ by the Spirit. God promised this in, in um, Ephesians 1, 13. We are, he has reconciled us to God in the church, through the cross, 2.16, and he guarantees our coming inheritance in Christ's kingdom because the Spirit is the down payment. So when you think about the Spirit is working and is active. But l listen to what Dr. Uh, Kent Hughes says. Um, he says, yet the church is often so spiritually empty. Some like ancient Israel have forsaken the spring of living water and they've dug out their own cisterns broken cisterns that really can hold no water. Others have no conscience departure and are, are present at the Lord's table, read their Bibles, lead steady lives, but have no joy or delight in the Lord. This is, again, you know, as he, he puts out, he points out that we need to be aware that we need to keep going back to God's word. Allow God's word to shape you. Allow God's word to and God's presence through his word to bring satisfying, filling joy that comes from God. That's not like a happy-go-lucky. It's an undercurrent of joy that we know that God is in control, that he's active. Listen to what Jesus says in John 7 and then in Revelation 22. He says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up, cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is something supernaturally that God alone can do. Um, Revelation basically almost ends. There's a couple more verses there, but he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. For I am the root and the descendant of David, and the bright morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So God is, is actively giving his spirit. Are we filled with or filled by the spirit? This is a question that the commentators wrestled with because the, the word there could go either way. Are we filled with the spirit or are we filled by the spirit? And you say, why is this important? Well, it's important because the Spirit, if it's just the Spirit fills us with himself, then we get one-third, we get a third of the Godhead. But it seems to indicate in the passage that the Spirit is the agent, he's the person of the Trinity that connects us to Christ that actually fills us with God's fullness. Not, not just himself, but he points to the Son, and the Father. And all three are filling up the believer so that we can actively say that God is with us. Emmanuel has come, and he's never left us since Pentecost. God has used his Spirit to connect his people and his church to himself. And the Spirit comes to fill us up. 
our triune God doesn't just give us knowledge. He gives us himself. He gives us his wisdom that is in himself. He gives us himself to the, to the extent that we come as beggars, not bringing anything of ourselves, but he gives us his fullness because he is the bread of life. This is not baptism of the spirit that happens once at conversion and then you just don't ever seek it. It's a constant yielding and submitting, repenting and believing, trusting in Christ that he produces in your life. Similar to like pointing a sail of a boat. This, this word filling actually has the same root of when a, a sail is filled up. You, you can choose not to angle the sail to be filled up. But if you are in God's word, he's going to fill you with his word, his presence, his wisdom. And this is what Paul is saying. He's, he's saying to point your sail, allow the spirit to fill you up because it's Christ who dwells in your hearts and is rooted and grounded in love. So Christ-centered is what happens when you are filled by the Spirit with the fullness of God. Mm -hmm. Paul covers all types of worship. He says, what's going to happen when this happens? Well, you can tell because there's going to be psalms, there's going to be hymns, there's going to be spiritual songs, and like a spring or well, they're going to flow up and bubble up out. So the gospel brings the song and it makes melodies. And this is a heart of joy that's redeemed and rescued and forgiven by Christ himself. Making melodies brings life, not death. Your life should be so affected by the good news of the gospel that it cannot help but sing to Christ. In all of your heart. That's the, the seat of vitality. Your life sings and is enlightened through the fact that the Spirit is filling you up with Christ, with the Father. We are experiencing God himself. So all that to say, we rejoice. We make Thanksgiving is another outworking of being filled with the Spirit. Uh, we make much of God's work to God the Father the, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all three of the Trinity are, are listed in this passage. In, in fact, Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of God richly dwell in you. Let the word of Christ which richly dwell in you. So it's, it's God's word itself brings about the filling of the spirit in your life. And he does this actively, day by day, if you yield to him. So does, does the word of God, the word of Christ dwell in you? Is your life increasingly becoming conformed to the likeness of Christ himself? the man who lived completely under the word and yet was the word with us? Or is there no-go areas that are isolated from the searching, intrusive, humbly ministry of the word of God and the spirit of God? We need to realize that there should be no off-limits to what God is doing in your hearts and lives, in my hearts and lives, my heart and life too. Uh, we always, our lives should reflect our great Redeemer. Everything that we do should be lived from the sovereign hand of God. And that even when trials and sufferings happen, we know that one day God is going to show all those sad things becoming untrue. And all things work together for his good, for our good to his glory. So God is the sustainer. He's the savior. In the name, we, we look to the risen king and we humbly submit, trusting Christ and submitting to each other out of reverence, fear, submitting, knowing that God is the author and has the authority over your life. Christ is over all his authority in leadership, in action. He rescues his church at the cross, ordains all things to happen, and yet works even seemingly awful things for good. He's not going to hold anything back from his church, and he's going to work everything for good because he gave us himself. And so this humility should transcend every part of our lives, knowing that we can be humbly confident with what God is doing. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says about this. It's, it's fascinating. He says, it is quite right that you should feel something terrific has happened to you. It has. And be all, glo all glowy. <laughs> That's a word, all glowy. Uh, accept these sensations with thankfulness as the birthday cards 
from God. We're talking about someone who just became a believer. But, but remember that they're only greetings, not the real gift. I mean, it is not the sensation that are the real thing. The real thing is the gift of the Holy Spirit, which can't, uh, which can't usually be, perhaps not ever, experienced as a sensation or emotion. The sensation is merely the response of your nervous system to it. Don't depend on that. Otherwise, when they go away and you are once more, you know, once more less emotionally and more flat, as uh, will certainly happen, you might think that the real thing is gone, but it won't be. It will be there when you can't even feel it. May even the most operative at the time that you least expect it. So God is operating. What he's saying is that it's not about a feeling, it's about a person. And the person of the Spirit is actively working in your lives as believers to look for the fruit, not necessarily just experience, but look for the fruit that God's doing in each other's lives. See how God is working. It, through the ordinary means of the everyday, he brings about this consistent joy that underpins our lives. The, the way in which we obey the command to be filled with the Spirit is by responding to the word that, of Christ, making room for it to influence and give into our minds the truth in our hearts, the teaching and our wills to the obedience. So these are all areas that God transforms our hearts by the gospel. In closing here, new hearts are reborn from good news, the Spirit brings to bear in our lives. So how we can redeem the time? How can we see God's wisdom lived out in a world decaying from busyness? How do we buy back what seems to be passing right through our fingers? Here's a couple closing thoughts. We are, bought, we are brought to Christ and continually submit to his wisdom, his will, his sovereign filling, and this is the command, not a suggestion. We are not free to ignore it. It's, it's a plural command. It's for the whole church. None of us are to be drunk, but all of us are to be filled with God's presence. Mm -hmm. it, it's a passive command, meaning let the Holy Spirit fill you. It is not a ritual or a formula, but it's a submission to God and his word. Turning from sin and trusting Christ, opening ourselves to the word of God, letting it richly dwell in us, and yielding to the Spirit is all part of that. It is a present tense, ongoing reality. It's not something that just happened, but it happens continually. Paul is saying that this should be a continual state of our living in Christ. That if you're thirsty, come. There's a free gift of living water. I close with this one verse from a song, a recent hymn. As morning dawns and day awakes to you, I bring my need. O oh, gracious God, my source of strength, in you I live and breathe. Each hour is yours by wisdom planned, each deed empowered by sovereign hands. Renew my spirit and help me stand. Be glorified today. Lord, we are grateful people. We are thankful people. And we are hopeful people because we know the best days are yet to come. We know that in Christ, we will one day see you face to face. We will see the kingdom yet to come that is unshakable and undeniable. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use your spirit to fill your people with your word and help us to lean in and trust you completely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor. You grab your hymnal. I think most people know this, but 653 is Make Me a Servant. Make Me a Servant. 653, we'll sing this in closing before our benediction.
servant. Make me a servant today. As you go, may Christ shine on you as you live in the goodness of his word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.